Ajjal Farajab In the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, dear viewers, to another podcast with another inspirational and special guest. A sincere and devoted scholar with more than a decade of his life in the Hawza. A spiritual warrior, a man with a mission, a man with a passion for sport, a loyal Liverpool supporter. The one and only Sayyid Hussein Mekki. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was a nice intro. <laughs> a nice man with a nice intro. Habibi, shukran. Welcome. Glad to have you here. An honor. A it's real pleasure honor. to have you here. My pleasure. Shukran. And uh, really looking forward to this conversation. So am I. Thank you for having me. Because we spent the day yesterday and mashallah, Sayyid Hussein has it all. <laughs> because um, we, have, we had deep conversations, wisdoms, shared knowledge, a lot of life lessons. But also a lot of banter, alhamdulillah. Habib Sajjad, well, it was a pleasure, my brother. Thank you for having me. Yes, Shukran. yes. We will, inshallah, discuss a variety of topics. Sure. But let's first begin with the man behind Sayyid Hussain. The man behind. The okay. man behind. Let's... But first, we will, inshallah, begin with a more background information about Sayyidna, about you. The childhood. You grew up as a Shia Lebanese kid mm. in the UK. And how was that for you? How did you experience that? Well, uh, um, I didn't know the difference between Shia and Sunni in my childhood, to be honest with you. Um, I grew up in an area where there were a lot of foreigners. I was born and raised in Tottenham, in London, UK. I think I was one of the only Shi'is in town, aside from you know, my cousins. But uh, mainly we, we identified as Muslim beyond mm -hmm. anything else. It was really uh, as, I, as I grew into uh, becoming a teenager that I saw that there was a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Because the closest Shi'i mosque was about an hour away. I would go during Muharram and during Shah Ramadan sometimes. So I loved Imam Hussein alayhi salam. I loved Imam Ali alayhi salam. That's pretty much what I knew though. Yeah. You know? um, as far as I knew, everyone's a Muslim and, and that was what I identified as. And the brothers that were in the community in Tottenham, I had a lot of Somalian friends. A lot of them are still my friends till now. I love them very much. But yeah, I didn't really know um, the difference between the two until I went into my adolescence. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you, you, you didn't feel any difference or... Uh, well, look, when, when I started, when I would talk about Imam Hussein alayhi salam and I realized people don't know what I'm talking about, uh -huh. that, I used to find that very weird. Mm -hmm. But my parents, I think they, they wanted to protect us. Mm -hmm. They didn't want us to get into any uh, strange arguments yeah. Anything we were already a minority, yeah. you know, a minority. So I don't think they wanted to infuse that in us. But as I grew, obviously, I started to ask questions, and my parents explained to me, and I realized there's a difference, and I wanted to find out more. Um, but I didn't become too religious until I was about 15, 16. Even then, it was just uh, you know quite average. Mm. Until I was 19 was when I really wanted to become close to my religion. So mm -hmm. it wasn't a big it wasn't a big part of growing up. Yeah. It was more cultural, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah. My parents were beautiful people, really loving. They had a lot of love. Uh, my siblings and I, we grew up with a lot of love for each other. But in terms of Islamic knowledge, they were simple uh, people that came from Lebanon trying to yeah. make ends meet. They didn't speak the language like so many other people that came from countries far away. They had to do their best Just for the their story families. Of, of every immigrant. Yeah. Basically, Basically, you know, your parents, I'm sure, went yeah. through the same thing. Yeah. Um, so at, at home, we'd have pictures of certain ulama. I wouldn't know who they were though, yeah. you know? I, I, I thought they were my uncle sometimes. <laughs> when I go to heaven, I wouldn't see them. And I'd say, where are, where are these people? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we didn't grow up with a lot of Islamic knowledge per se, but there was a lot of love. And I think that love, love of uh, even Ahlul Bayt, love of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, of Imam Ali, usually those are the two Imams that the young Shi'i oh, yeah. hears, out, hears about first. Of course. Yeah. So th that's what I knew, but I didn't know any of the names of the 12 Imams hmm. until I was about 19. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I knew Imam Hassan, you know, that's pretty much it. Uh, the rest of the Imams I didn't know. So I, I was a very, very late bloomer, if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my yeah. siblings now, they're not like that. Um, my parents now, my mother wears a abaya, oh, you know, a shador now, yeah. or abaya as we call it in Lebanon, abaya al ras. She doesn't go out without it. Mm. So my family became very religious later on. But in my early years, it wasn't that way. It yeah. was actually um, 
we're just trying to survive, man. Wow, yeah. Yeah, in yeah, Tottenham, yeah. Tottenham is a very tough area. Okay. Yeah. So Tottenham is a difficult area to grow up in. So we were just really trying to survive. We were, yeah. we were othered a lot of the time. You know, there were a lot of immigrants around, yeah. and every immigrant was othered by locals. Wow. It was a difficult time growing up, um, but subhanAllah, it made us really strong. It mm. made us close. Wow. Yeah, so it wasn't really difficult as a Muslim so much as it was as an Arab. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Different. it was yeah. different, yes. Yeah. And you said uh, beautifully that when you became 19, that was when you first got that spark. Yes. And what instigated that spark? Because you said uh, along the years you and your family developed and got closer to your religion mm. and practicing your religion. Mm. Uh, what instigated that spark for you personally? And was that hand in hand with the development religiously of your family? For me, I was always a seeker. I think my mother, she's a deep thinker, my mother. Mm. My mother, she's a deep thinker, my father is a very determined person. Mm. So I think I received a lot of determination from my father, but my wondrous nature came from my mother. Mm. And I used to love to read books. Um, I was really into philosophy. I would like to find out about the world, generally speaking. Mm. Religion wasn't a big part of my life at that time. But when I would come to religion and realize that it's answering a lot of my questions, I became more interested. Wow. I knew that I should be more religious. When I say religious, it's not like you're going doing haram things. Mm -hmm. It's more of how prevalent it is in your life, in your worldview. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on your mind? It wasn't such a big deal for me when mm -hmm. I was younger. Mm -hmm. And what happened was as I was searching for these answers, and I had a lot of anxiety because I wanted these answers. I saw a lot of, let's say, oppression around me. And this is what happens when you're younger you gravitate towards wanting to belong in a certain group. Mm. And I never felt like I belonged in any group. So I was searching for that group yeah. and I wanted to join some sort of cause and help people. And when you're younger, you have that energy that yes. you want to do that. I went through an experience when I was with my friends, I went through an experience where it was soul shaking, this experience. Um, and I've spoken about it a few times. Uh, people who have watched some of my content before know about it. I, I was hiking and I got lost in, in these mountains overnight and I had like a near death experience basically, yeah. long story short. Wow. And when I returned from that, I really wanted to come towards purpose and meaning because that night really shook me. Oh, wow. And the nights that followed shook me. I had a lot of nightmares, dreams. I really wanted to be closer to God. Wow. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. that night I remember looking at the sky yeah. and really feeling insignificant to the point like I was I was on this mountain yeah. and this mountain was huge and I couldn't get down from yeah, it. Yeah. I couldn't leave. It was the middle of the night and I was stuck on there. And I was looking into the sky and the, the sea was encompassing us and then the sky is encompassing the sea. And then there's little old me, little old me that thinks that the world revolves around them. Mm. That constantly thinks that you're the center of, of the world mm. or the one that everyone needs to see and care about. And at that moment, I didn't care about anything. I, I felt so small, but at the same time, we know Imam Ali Islam, he says, yeah. that you think you're just a small, tiny entity, but within you all the world yeah. reside. Yeah. And over the years, I came to see all these worlds that reside within us as well. So although, although you're insignificant, when you give up everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you very significant in His eyes. You know, everyone's trying to become a somebody mm -hmm. when throughout life you're supposed to become a nobody. Wow. And when you become a nobody, you become a somebody, somebody. with Allah oh, subhanahu wow. ta'ala. Yeah. So yeah, that, that night made me realize I'm a nobody. And, and I wanted to, to return and um, become close to my religion. MashaAllah, yeah. what a beautiful experience. Yeah. And that answered my question because I wanted to ask what the spark became when you became 19 and what instigated that it became a burning flame. And that was that experience Ahsan, of yours. It became a burning flame. Yeah, yeah. yeah I came to London yeah. and I wanted to start. Yeah. And uh, my friend told me to come to the mosque. Yeah. Like actually start to go to the train underground, go to the mosque yourself and yeah. put some effort in. Yeah. And I would go and I would try to read Quran, even though I couldn't read Arabic. Mm. I was 19, I couldn't yeah, read yeah. Arabic. And there were children sitting around reading Quran and I couldn't read. I'd sit with them, it was Surat Al-Mulk. And I, till now, have a very soft spot in my heart for Surat Al-Mulk because that's where it all started for us. Wow. Yeah, and the teacher would tell us, you know, start to, to learn this surah. I was 19, 20 years old and the kids were nine years old around me. 
and we all had the homework uh, of going through the mulk and it started yeah. from there really subhanallah beautiful yeah. beautiful and now then you proceeded to religious academia yeah but you said something interesting you said when i went seeking religion and uh, reading and getting deeper into religion I started seeing that religion answers my questions. Mm. But today, nowadays, I hear the opposite of you. They say religion doesn't answer my questions, so I seek something else. I become agnostic, I go, become at atheistic. atheist. Uh, what, can you give examples of questions you had back in the day as a teenager and religion gave you the answers? Mm. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, May Allah have mercy on the one who knows where he is, from where he came and where he's going. Min ain, fi ain, ila ain. Those are the questions everyone has. Mm. I'm here. Why am I here? What's my purpose? Where am I going? Where did I come from? What's the meaning of all this? When I was younger, and I would see a lot of suffering, because suffering really pushes the mark, makes you ask these questions when you see, is there any meaning in this suffering of people around the world? And how can I alleviate the suffering from people? And you're looking for these answers. I found these answers within religion because I was looking at religion not from the lens of what I'm only supposed to do and not supposed to do in terms of what's forbidden for me and what's allowed for me, which is how maybe we're taught religion mm -hmm. growing up, halal, haram. Yes. You think Islam equals fiqh. Mm -hmm. Even though fiqh is a very important part of Islam, you should not transgress against the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because yeah. you hurt your own soul. Mm -hmm. It's very important. But that's, I see that as the, the minimum basics. There is something that you can't do taqlid in. You know, you and I do taqlid of a marja yeah. because we follow the expert yes. on what the ahkam are. Yes. But there's something you can't do taqlid in, and that's your aqaid, yes. your belief system. So you can't do taqlid, you can't follow someone when it comes to learning about how you got here, Allah's existence, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you being here, what's your purpose, uh, Quran and prophethood, where you're going, afterlife. You have to be able to come to a conclusion where these beliefs are part and parcel of who you are. Only then will you allow yourself to subscribe to those limits that we can't transgress mm -hmm. with a full and calm and content heart because you know, okay, I believe in God and this is the message God sent me. But we're doing the opposite. The reason why a lot of people are saying, okay, I can't find answers in religion is because they're not looking for those answers. They don't even realize they're there. They don't know the language to find the answers in and they have understood the paradigm of religion to be, it's just what you do and what you can't do. Yes. They don't know about the responsibility upon them own selves. That Allah wants you to find the answers to these questions. He's actually pushing you to find the answers to these questions. It's wajib on you to yeah. find the answers to these questions. And yes, within religion, within the words of Ahlul Bayt and the guidance of the Quran, there are so many answers for one who wants to see, who is patient, but this is the thing, you don't get answers overnight. No. You have to be patient. patient, you have to be humble, you have to be sincere. These are three really important keys when you're looking for answers. Patience, humility, and sincerity. You have to be humility because you don't know everything, you're not supposed to know everything, yes. and you're not entitled to know everything. And, yeah. You know, sometimes when we're young we think we are. If you can't answer me, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Calm down, even yeah. if I answer you, who said you're going to understand? Who said your capacity allows you to receive what I'm about to give you? Yeah. You can't handle it yet. You have to grow. Humble. Be humble. Know mm. your level. Know yourself. Be patient. It takes time. It didn't, I start straight away praying. It didn't work. Mm. What do you mean it didn't work? Mm. What are you waiting for exactly? You think it's a switch? Yes. Having zero expectations when you're starting this. Season. You know what? It's not about having zero expectations it's as much as it is being patient with it, being humble with it and patient with it. With expectations, I mean, don't be prejudgmental. Ahsan. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't be prejudgmental. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Persevere and be sincere. Sincere. Yeah. Honestly, seek and ask. Yeah. I, th I think a lot of the time right now, the misconceptions we have are because we don't know what is even incumbent upon us. Mm -hmm. We don't know what our literature holds. We don't know what the opportunities are that we have. We have a treasure chest. A treasure chest, especially in the modern world. It's a world right now of insanity, a world of meaninglessness, yeah. a world of meaningless suffering, a world of robots, a world of mechanics. It's the modern world. There's nothing yeah. sacred. It's all profane. Yeah. And in religion, in an objective way, 
objective path that you live, there's something sacred and there is meaning to your suffering, to your hardship and to the way that you want to live your life, there is purpose. It's not without purpose. Mm. Everything is with purpose. That's really what religion offers you, this deep purpose for your existence and why you're here. You're driven by something and for something and you have a higher ideal and goal and you're going towards it. Whereas the world right now is a world of subjectivity and relativity and it's your truth is respected and yes. my truth is respected and you can do what you want, I can do what I want and then you can call yourself whatever you want, I can call myself whatever and I want. And the truth can change within time. In that there case, is no truth. Yes. There is no truth. It can keep changing. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. As if truth becomes something that is negative. Mm -hmm. They'll say, hey, you're an absolutist. Hey, you're... Who said it was negative to pursue truth? There is truth. Yeah. Truth is real. We believe in truth. Something objective. Religion offers you a proper way to live. Yes. Something objective. A proper value system. It offers you purpose. It offers you meaning. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. This is so, so, so beneficial and the you persuade pursued the religious academia you went to the hausa but unlike the majority of western students who seek religious academia you didn't went to the uh, hausa of qom the institute of qom of the institute of uh, najaf which mm -hmm. are very popular and known among the people but you chose the hausa the religious institute of academia of islam in lebanon Mm. Uh, Jabal Amil. Mm. Yes. Tell us the story. What made you choose to go for Le uh, Lebanon? Unlike a lot of Western students who go to Qom, to Najaf. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Najaf is the original Hausa. Mm. It's the Hausa of Sheikh Tusi. Uh, Najaf has the shrine of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Uh, Najaf is legendary. Yeah. You know, as a place, as a symbol of the Shayyu. At the same time, uh, Qom is also legendary now. All the ulama and experts, the urafa, the, the marajir, mujtahids, you find so many of them in Qom, the classes, the variety, and the shrine of Sayyidah Fatima Asuma alayhi salam, it's in Qom. Qom has become a city of pure Tashayyu and knowledge, alhamdulillah, for the last century. So, they're both dream destinations for me, both of them. But when I moved, I was 21 years old when I left London. So I grew up in London, born in London, raised in London, grew up in London. I left when I was 21, but I didn't leave to go to Hausa. Mm. That wasn't the intention. Okay. I left to learn Arabic. Oh. Yes, yeah. I left to learn Arabic, first of all, before anything. Hausa was always a dream, but I had spoken to my parents and I said, look, I'll go for one year because I was working in Paris at the time. Okay. I had a job in Paris. It was a well-paying job. My parents didn't want me to leave. And I said, I'll only go for a year. And I, it was that time that I was becoming very religious. And I wanted to uh, learn about the Quran more. And I needed Arabic, Arabic. as a language. Yeah. Yes, I'm Lebanese, but I spoke a certain way that only my parents understood <laughs> me. So I didn't really understand Arabic. I wanted to go and study Arabic. And in Lebanon, I have my grandparents. And in Lebanon, um, when it was the easiest place to go as a Lebanese person. But when I went there, I met ulama there. Mm -hmm. And the ulama there saw that I had some potential and a love of Islam. And they took me in. And they ended up teaching me Arabic inside the dorms of the Hausa. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't find a place to learn Arabic. Yeah. They told me, come live with us. Obviously, I couldn't attend classes no. because I didn't understand them. Yeah. They offered me to live with them in the dorms. So I lived inside the Hausa dorms. And I would be taught by the shuyukh that lived inside the Hausa. After a year, I loved it so much, I wanted to stay. Now, I had the ambition of going to uh, Qom more so than Najaf at the time. Yeah. Um, just because there, it was a lot simpler for one to live in terms of yeah, resources and international students. Yeah. Yes. But at the same time, I wanted Arabic. Yeah, and, yeah. and over there, I have to learn Farsi. Farsi yeah. So Najaf would be the place to go and learn Arabic. Yeah. But I'm already in an Arabic-speaking country. Yeah. At the same time, Lebanon has a great history for ulama and for institutions of the Hausa, in Jabal Hamil especially. So it's where Shahid al-Awwal and Shahid al-Thani would teach and study in Jazin, the village now known as Jazin, which became a Christian village, interestingly yeah. enough now. Oh, wow. But it was a center for the Hausa before. Yeah. Great ulama like Shaykh al-Baha'i, 
that is buried in Mashhad. Sheikh Baha'i is Lebanese. Uh, the compiler of Wasa'ul Shia, right? That book is the book that all Mujtahids now use. That book was compiled by Sheikh Al Hur Al Amili, who's also of Lebanese heritage. So we have so many scholars that were brought up, studied, and came from Lebanon. That was a thing. Hawza of Jabal Amil was always a thing. But it died out after the Ottoman Empire. There was a lot, mm. of, um, a lot of hardships that they had to go through. Mm. And in recent times, what happened was after a few generations of ulama in Lebanon in, that were Lebanese, after a few generations of ulama that were Lebanese had studied in Qom, they came back to Lebanon and started rebuilding the villages in the way of the Hawza, setting up villages of knowledge. Mm. And I found myself by accident in this place, in this place. amongst these teachers. Wow. And after a year and a half, I loved it so much, a year to a year and a half, and I got the hang of Arabic. It was very difficult to get the hang of Arabic, mm -hmm. but I got the hang of Arabic and I stayed. I became very close to my teacher. He's like my second father now. Sure. I, I live right next to him still, yeah. till now, a decade later. So, although I don't fully believe in accidents, I think everything happens for a reason. Mm, I think this happened for a reason as well. I think I wanted something mm. and I asked Allah for it and he took my hand. Yeah. And he, he paved the way for me, alhamdulillah. I gen genuinely did not have any ambitions to be a sheikh or to be a speaker. Or I didn't even know I could speak publicly. I used to shake in my boots wow. when I would speak in front of class. So amazing so, and funny at the same time. You yeah. just went for Arabic and <laughs> wow. Yeah, later, yeah, and I never went back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I go in the summers. I yeah. remember the first time I went to London yeah. a few years later to, uh, to lead Jama'ah prayer. And my father was in the front row of the jama'ah and looked at me in my abai, he's like, you're leading jama'ah? <laughs> I wow, said, Baba, you amazing. go ahead. He's like, no, no, you go, you do it. Yeah, now he's happy, you know, now he's alhamdulillah, he's happy, he's proud, my mother is as well. Beautiful. And um, I'm very be. thankful for, for, for them and everything that I do, yeah. everything that I do goes back to them, especially, you know, the way my mother uh, raised me with so much uh, love, so much like deep love. I think that's what, that's what, really allows me to enjoy practicing my religion. I really love, I love in my religion, Allah and the Ahlul Bayt, I love them. I feel genuine love in my life. My mother really infused that love in me and my father worked really hard. Beautiful. May my Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really bless your parents for planting the seeds of Deen in your heart alhamdulillah. and every parent. May Allah bless so, all our parents. Yeah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And it's so amazing, the story of Went to, going to Lebanon to just re, to learn Arabic yeah. and then becoming 10 years later, mashallah, a scholar which people look up to, an influencer in its best of ways. Inshallah and uh, <laughs> the end goal was this, when you were 21 was the end goal, was just learning Arabic and coming back to understand my religion better. Yes. And now uh, you fell in love with the Hausa lifestyle, you fell in love with the knowledge you're gaining. Uh, during the years, of course, then the end goal changed. You, you get a new end goal, you formulate a new end goal in your mind. And what's the end goal for Sayyid Hussain Mecki now? The end goal? Yeah. Oh, alhamdulillah, I mean, I have a lot of goals. Mm. You know, obviously the end goal for all of us is salvation. Mm. Uh, but a lot of goals in dunya before that, uh, I've always wanted to be an author when I was a child. I, I loved fantasy and fiction. I always wanted to write. I used to write little stories for my oh. teachers. Nice. And that hasn't changed. I still would love to be an author. Maybe not so much fiction right now, yeah. but I'm working on a few projects at the moment, books that I would love to write. So Mashallah. I really want to get into writing books, but I haven't completed the level of studying that I would want to. So I want to do that first, mm. and then I'll, inshallah, commit my time to these books. And this is the beautiful thing about going towards scholarship. Uh, you find scholars, they peak at 60, yeah. uh, 70 years old, yeah, yeah. right? Whereas, you know, a footballer peaks at 25 to 30, yes. 27, 28, 29, and then the rest of his, his life is a pundit or a manager yeah. or whatever else. But with scholars, the beginning of their lives, their youth is built upon gaining and building. And then afterwards, they start disseminating knowledge when they actually become that knowledge. It becomes mm -hmm. a part of them. So I'm still building myself at the moment. I still go around, I lecture, I, alhamdulillah, I, I do write. Yes. Um, I've got a lot of unfinished literature that I've written. Wow. Um, and I'm English or Arabic? In English. English, yes, yes. very beneficial. In English, yeah. a lot of different um, ideas, alhamdulillah. But yeah, those are 
those are a big goal for me in the future, mm -hmm. inshallah, so to write. And I would love to one day, hopefully, uh, contribute to an institution yeah. that's respected worldwide that combines um, traditional Islamic scholarship and Western academia with the greatest minds that we have, inshallah, if I can work alongside them, I would love to provide that to our people in the Western world. Wow. Yeah, that's something that I've always wanted it's to It's a do. beautiful end goal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the tawfiq and success to proceed that goal, Shukran. inshallah wa ta'ala. And it's so nice, the comparison you made between a footballer and athlete and the scholar, because Islam is timeless. Islam has no space, has no boundaries. Mm. So you always can learn more and develop. Mm. And so you need to be 60 because when we, in our academy, we study 10 years, we become an expert, it's finished. We know everything we should know on different fields. Yeah. But when it comes to Islam, it's like it's there always and there's always more. It's like an endless container of, of it's, it's an, an ocean without ending of knowledge. And, you know what's interesting is yeah. the path of knowledge is so different to every other path. Yeah. It's a dangerous path. Yeah. It can lead you away from Allah if you become egotistical or arrogant. Mm. But if you do it sincerely, it's the path that brings you closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you look at our ulama, and the legends, especially of the last century, just because they are the most recent ones and we have so much from them and you can see the pictures and videos. Mm. You see, it wasn't just knowledge. They had purified themselves. So for every hour of knowledge, they'd spend an hour or two on deskia and purification. Mm -hmm. So they don't allow their egos or their arrogance to grow with that knowledge. It's only knowledge for the love of Allah and sincerity. They want to go to Allah. Yes. So you realize when you see an elderly person who is normal, for example, and he's suffering from something like Alzheimer's. We take care of our parents and grandparents when they suffer from such a disease. Yes. And one of the symptoms is they start to hide things. It's one of the first things they do. Yeah. I was at one of my friend's houses recently and his father, when he walked in, he would walk and just take something from in front of me. He had Alzheimer's and he'll take it and he'll hide it because he think I'm going to take it from him because mm -hmm. it's his. Yeah. He doesn't want anyone to take it, it's his. So they start to hide things, they forget things. And so we were just sitting down, letting him do it, you know, yeah. and then my friend would sit him, his father down. One of the interesting things is, it's reported by the people who were with Alama Tabatabai. At the end of his life, they say he also suffered from Alzheimer's, but he wouldn't hide things. He wouldn't have the same symptoms as normal elderly people. And we were thinking of why. And because he had developed his nafs, he had purified himself to the point where there was no ego. That is mine. Mm. There was nothing to hide for me because he had purified himself to a point where even when now he was no longer conscious, he's still able, if you want, his soul is still able to override the yeah, disease yeah. to a certain extent where the ego isn't there. Yeah. So he's not hiding things. Yeah, yeah. He's okay, forgetful. He can't remember. Whatever yeah, happened his mind to is him, detached from this worldly. But his, yeah, yeah, it was detached. Yeah. So subhanAllah, even there, not only with knowledge, but even with purification, it aids you in your elderly life. Like, I don't fear, alhamdulillah, elderly life or um, imprisonment or whatever else it is because ultimately all I need is a book and a light and a pen. Um, you, you learn to live with this as, as pleasure. It becomes the greatest pleasure that you can ever live when you gain some knowledge or you figure something out or you're creating. This is the greatest pleasure you can ever live. Mm -hmm. After a certain point, it becomes something that there's nothing in life that you'd rather be doing or experience than the gaining of knowledge. Wow, subhanAllah. And sticking on this um, topic of knowledge, of gaining knowledge, I think gaining of knowledge and yani, expanding, reading, writing, doing <coughs> research, and just store knowledge in your mind, in your heart, is part one of, 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 of salvation. Mm. I think. The other, which is more difficult, is to practice that knowledge which you have gained. Mm. Because we can be a container of knowledge and just keep reading books and memorizing it and be a drop box of knowledge. But when people outside us don't see how we practice that knowledge, how we live, how that knowledge influenced us in our daily lives, I think that knowledge is useless in some kind of way. And how do you, as someone who spent a decade of his life in the house, and more than a decade, and gained so much knowledge, 
try to practice it because in some ways it's easy to practice you know I have to do my prayer this way and it will be more beneficial for example or this dua but in some ways and when it comes to societal uh, teachings how do you practice that and is it difficult because that's how I see it to practice all the knowledge you yeah, have of course it's yeah. very difficult look I'm not a fool. Yeah. <laughs> I recognize that I go into... Alhamdulillah, <laughs> I'm not a fool. <laughs> I recognize that I'm going to different communities because there's something that I'm able to offer them. Mm -hmm. I recognize that. And I can't let it get to my head because the only reason that they would listen to me is because I'm offering something about Allah or the Ahlul Bayt. I'm giving them something sacred. It's not because of who I am. The mistake mm -hmm. is when you start thinking that you are that person, so, that they look yeah. at you for you. Yeah. At the same time though, you must recognize that you are the vessel that's being used right now. So you better respect yourself to a very high standard, to an excellent standard, because you are right now portraying yourself as a symbol mm -hmm. of what you're saying. So you have a huge responsibility on everyone. Yes. You can't fail them. Yes. The best way to do this is to have teachers in front of you that you can emulate. They raise you up. That's why it's important on this path to have teachers. Mm -hmm. Doing it on your own is not only not the same, I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's dangerous to do it on your own. You have to have teachers. And those teachers, you have to know them. They have to raise you. And you get to a certain place. Alhamdulillah, I think I was able to get to a certain place with my teacher that I have absorbed several of my teachers that if there's a problem, I can think how they think and see how would they solve that problem and I would emulate how they'd solve it because I know how they think. Yeah. And they are wiser and greater than I am. And I think they receive that from their teachers as well. This is the way it's passed down generation to generation, that's, that's our path. That's why yeah. we say knowledge is taken from the chest of the ulama. Yeah. It's different to seeking knowledge online or seeking knowledge on your own or reading a book. When someone in front of you, sometimes my teacher, he tells me something I already know. But when I look at his face, it's ibadah. Because looking at the face of the man of knowledge, yes. of the people of knowledge, it's is ibadah. He tells me the same thing I know, it enters my heart. It's different. Oh, now, I, now it becomes a part of me. Now it's a spiritual reality. Now I want to apply it. When I come around, I realize I have responsibility in front of people. And if I'm not up to this, resp up to this responsibility, let me take a step back and sit down. Mm. No one said that you have to be there in front of everyone and traveling and going to these communities. But if you are, you better uphold that responsibility and you have to be what you're preaching. So maybe something that's okay for everyone else and halal, maybe it's not okay for you. Like I don't wear short sleeves, for mm -hmm. example. Just a small, small example. Yeah, as part of my hijab, yeah. as a man of God, I don't wear short sleeves in front of uh, strange people. Yeah. You know, when I say strange people, not, they're not strange. <laughs> <laughs> as in non-mahram. Non -mahram, yeah, yes, yes. You know, a non-mahram woman, I wouldn't, she didn't, can't see my arms. It's not haram though. No. But I wouldn't do that. Just no. as a responsibility, there's yeah. something I'm responsible for. Or, yeah. You can be a normal person in the community and Adi Habibi, go away your short sleeves, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. But there's a responsibility you have to apply. Now, it's even greater than this. Knowledge must become a part of you to the point that you don't hurt, you don't hurt people, which is now a very common thing. You know, they say, don't meet your heroes yes. because they might let you down. Oh, yeah. You have to be so careful true. you don't let anyone down. So not true. to impress them, but not to let down their vision of faith and religion. Yes. You have to uphold yes. that for them until they get to a level where they can look beyond you and they see, don't look at who said it, look at what was said, yeah. you know? Look at truth, you will find its men, as yes. Imam Ali Islam says. Yes. It's not yeah. about looking at men to find the truth. Yeah, but in the beginning, people that gravitate to, towards Allah through certain symbols and people. And if you are one of those people in the community or a shaykh or an influencer or whatever else, you have to realize that you have that responsibility. It's not enough to say, I'm not a shaykh. I'm not on the member. If you are someone people look to, if you are someone that has some clout, you have responsibility. If you're representing religion, that is, you have responsibility to those people and to faith and to your religion to represent it correctly. Mm. Um, I was just in uh, Melbourne, and when I came from Melbourne, um, the brother, he received me at the airport, and we had a beautiful time together. And then just before I left, he said, you know, I was really worried about you coming. And I said, why? And he said, because I was worried that you wouldn't be who I thought you were. I had followed your content for years and I really liked your content. And I was worried that in person, sometimes I may have met some people that let me down. Mm. I was really hoping you don't let me down. Yeah. And SubhanAllah, I, mean, I hope I didn't let him down, but mm. SubhanAllah, <laughs> uh, that's so real. It's so real, yeah. you know? 
the idea of don't meet your heroes, it hurts when it's about religion. Yeah. And it can make someone give up. Yeah. You shouldn't. No, no. You shouldn't. You know, I've been let down by a lot of people that represented religion yeah. when I was younger. I met some people that I thought were the real deal and they weren't. Yeah. And it hurts a lot. And you don't want to be that. Yeah. You know, so you have to be, you have to apply. Um, the, in the honorations, it says the person in the hellfire with the most stench that all the other inhabitants of hell run away from is the alim wow. that did not apply his knowledge. Yeah. yeah, the one that told you do this and do that and he didn't do it, the hypocrite. Yes. It's the stenchiest. Wow. And that's how the Southern nations describe him. <laughs> wow, it's, it's heavy. So, wouldn't being a huge blessing to serve the community, serve them and te the teaching and propagating the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, it's a heavy and huge burden, as you said. Because if you, if, if, if you fail in it, you will be accountable on the Day of Judgment and Allah will be more severe with you than with the normal you. Look, I realize... Yeah. I realize that this podcast even is a very personal one, very yeah. different to everything yeah. else yeah. I've ever done, to be honest. It's about how we are living yeah. as, let's say, scholars. And I would say that, yes, it's, it's so difficult because your private life and public life become merged. merged yeah. uh, so it's very difficult. You don't get that I go home and I'm not a sheikh anymore. You're a sheikh forever. 24-7. You're yeah. a sheikh and people need you yeah. all the time. You, know, you have to be able to to have a life with yeah. your family that yeah. is healthy you know you can't let that override your health your family yeah. health but people expect a lot from you and you have to uphold that responsibility to the certain extent that you're still healthy i, yeah. don't, I don't advise anyone to uh, sacrifice themselves to the extent that they're no longer healthy or the families are not healthy because you have to show an example yes, of, of a family and children and marriage as a scholar yeah. So I think that you have to take care of the family dynamics, the health, your own health. But yeah, it's very difficult. And also because before it becomes something, before it became something that you're disseminating and it's a responsibility and you're giving to people, it was between you and God. Mm -hmm. It was always between you and Allah only. Yeah. And then now it isn't. Because now you have to be careful about how you represent the religion to everyone else. So you have to be really careful. It's a slippery slope. You have to constantly make sure that you're doing it out of God consciousness, yes. you know, and you're still yourself. Uh, this is one thing that I've tried to maintain in the last decade, through all the ups and downs that I went through yeah. and all the times that I tried to imitate someone else. Yes. I'm not a 60 year old scholar that lived in Najaf his whole life. I'm not that. No. And I'm not a spiritual, uh, a spiritual Arif that, you know, Salaamu Alaikum. That's just not me. Yeah. It's, it's not who I am. Yeah, yeah. You know, I respect both. But I'm not going to act like both because I'm not like that. No. You know, I'm I'm a kid from Tottenham. Stay true to yourself. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. I'm from London. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I studied now eleven years yeah. in the Hausa and I apply I I apply the ethics of Islam in my life, but my personality is fine. Yeah. And I think that we should stay authentic, you know, and as long as you present the religion correctly. You stay authentic, people see that and they gravitate towards that and it's a magnet, they see it's real. But when you have, if I'm 20 years old, I'm 20 years old and I'm talking like I've been in Najaf my whole life, yeah. I can see it's not real. Real, yes. And people yeah. can see that's not can real. see that, yes. Especially in this day and age. Yeah, yeah. we can see it's not yeah. real. Yeah. So I think that authenticity, nothing can replace authenticity. Yeah. And you can do this, you can be, you can embrace your personality, who you are to the extent that it's within the limits of Islam, whilst representing it in the correct way and yes. realizing you have responsibility towards people to do that. Ahsantum. And you're doing that in a great way. Alhamdulillah, you're portraying Thank you, brother. You're very nice. <laughs> <laughs> you, say, you talked about ups and downs when answering that question. And we, every human being in this world is facing ups and downs. No life is without problems, failures, and everybody uh, manages or copes with it differently. You as yourself, having studied here in the West and studied uh, Hausa for more than 10 years, I bet you had a lot of failures, you can say, uh, essays, what, not working out projects, not working out, uh, failing tests maybe, or failing to understand something, even with your bachelor and masters you had, and uh, career failings, failures in your career, where you stop, you get, you get stuck, you can't go, move on. How do you cope with that? 
And how does religion help you to cope with that? Because we live in a very competitive era. We have a LinkedIn, we have an Instagram. Everyone is comparing their lives with others. And failures are not being uh, put on LinkedIn or on, spot, uh, or on Instagram. Only the successes are shared. So, so for example, my neighbor has his master's degree, has a big car, has success in his career, has multiple uh, uh, companies. But I don't know what happened before he reached that state. But a failure, uh, and with depression and anxiety, a failure is heavy, is a heavy loss nowadays, even more than back in the day, because comparison wasn't a thing. You couldn't see what your neighbor was doing or how he reached that state. So they say comparison is the thief of joy, and that's true. And failure is a big L in this day and age. Mm. And how do we as Muslims cope with that? Because failure, uh, multiple failures in life can lead to depression and solitude from society because you don't want to be in society when you are not a successful person between uh, quotation because success is for everybody different of course but I mean the worldly success mm. which we uh, portray how do we cope with that and how does religion how can religion help us managing that failure I mean it would help us to define failure first of all because yeah. I don't really subscribe to the common definition yeah. I mean I would say first of all yeah. uh, failure is always going to happen if yes. you're venturing into unknown territory yeah. but for me I don't see failure as an actual reality because I only fail when I give up I only fail when I stop mm. and if I don't stop I don't fail uh, everything else is just a setback it's a lesson and a setback and that's how I see it it's just something that you learn from and you keep moving forward but failure itself is if I stop and I think the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about sins in the Quran when someone sins against their own self he says you sin against your own self hmm. Ya ibadi or my servant he doesn't, the, the way that he uses ibadi here as well he's saying my servant I know you're, you belong to me you're my servant and you must stop Ya ibadi ladina asrafu ala anfusihim you've transgressed against yourself La taqnatu min rahmatillah don't despair of the mercy of Allah La taqnatu. Yeah. Don't despair. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all sins. Uh, that, when you look at it in terms of sin, it applies to failure too. Do not despair. Mm. Because when you sin, and you ask Allah for forgiveness, and then you do it again, you say, oh, I messed up, that's messed it. Up. You say, no, no. Ask Allah for forgiveness again. again. Yes. And then you sin a third time. You know, oh, I messed up. Ask Him a fourth time, fifth time. Allah will forgive you every single time. Yeah. Until the time where you say, I give up. I don't ask forgiveness. I don't ask anymore. Yeah. I give up. That's it. It's done. Then yeah. that's it. You're not willing to ask anymore. Yeah. You're not willing to receive anymore. You're yeah. done. You finish yourself. You finish yourself. Same you thing with up. failure. SubhanAllah, whatever. Same thing with failure. With failure, so. I'm going to keep moving forward. All right, I learned the lesson. It didn't go this way. I'll learn how to go that way. I'll learn how to go this way. Left, right, center. I'll have new tactics, new ways, new people, new networking. But you have to have a foundation of contentment within you, though. Yeah. I mean, I'm saying all of this as someone with a lot of strength of conviction. If you don't have strength of conviction, then of course you're not going to have anything to bounce off of. So that's going to be an earlier step that you have to Go really through. build and apply. Yeah. You have to have contentment. As the Imam says, that contentment is a treasure and it never perishes. Mm -hmm. It's a treasure. Kens. Because when you, when you are content, when you have a gratitude mindset, when you look at around you right now, I'm so grateful for this cup of water right now. If I didn't have this, I'd be so thirsty and I'd have a dry throat. And right now I can't drink it because it'll make a weird noise in the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, having a, a gratitude mindset yeah. of everything around you, Alhamdulillah, I'm here. I have my two legs, my two arms. I can see, I'm feeling, alhamdulillah, rested. I'm here, I have my parents, I have whatever else it is. If I'm hungry, I can go eat. You look around you for the most mundane things. I'm so grateful I'm on a chair right now. If I don't have a chair, I'd be standing up. Something as silly as that. You develop a gratitude mindset constantly in life. You're constantly content, no matter what you're going through. And I'm saying it as someone, personally, who's been through, I can speak for myself quite a lot, Alhamdulillah, I don't feel an inch broken or tired or fragmented because of it. It's all led me to become stronger, um, just pushing through all these different lessons, setbacks, moving, 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 till you get to a place. Alhamdulillah, you don't fear anything. You know, Allah's watching me. Imam Hussain alayhi salam, when he held his baby in his arms and the arrow pierced 
his baby's neck. He said, Ya Allah, I am patient for what is happening here because you are watching me. Allah, you're watching me. I think that we have to look at Karbala not as a slogan, but actually understand that you are constantly faced with a crossroads, choices in life where you can say, Allahumma taqabbal minna hadha al-qurban, Lord, accept from me this sacrifice, or why me? Mm. Ya Allah, why? Why me? Why do you do this to me? I'm so good. I'm such a good person. Why do bad things happen to me? That's like asking a lion why he attacked you because you're a vegetarian. You know, it doesn't work that way. The world doesn't work that way. Yeah. The world is always going to break your heart. It's designed to break, break your heart. It comes towards trying to harm you and break your heart. It's designed that way. Yeah. Through failures, through death, through changing, constantly. So it depends what it is that we're defining failure as because we can go through hardships, difficulties, failures, bala, whatever it is. But all of this is supposed to lead you to a place of knowing yourself, of testing yourself. Life, a lot of the time, that's why I love the gym. Yeah. Life is like that. When you're at the gym, you fight against resistance to become stronger. Yes. And once it becomes easy, you increase the weight. Mm -hmm. And you lift more weight and you become even stronger. Mm -hmm. Life is resistance. Wow. Failures are uh, resistance against you. Bala, difficulties, they're all the resistance. And you have enough tools in your deen through being inspired, through the stories of the prophets, through dua, through a proximity in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get through this resistance stronger than before. Look at our leaders. I wonder why our leaders never fall to their failures or to their anxiety or to their troubles. Or, you know, if one of our leaders woke up tomorrow and said, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really interested in Palestine. Um, right. Today is a bad day for me. I'm not, I can't do anything. Habibi, it doesn't work that way. We're all relying on you. Yeah. You know, there's a big, big, big issue at hand and you're responsible. And he doesn't mean he doesn't get tired. Of course he gets tired. Mm. Of course it's hard for him. Definitely. But then he sits with Allah the same way Abu Abdullah salam, sat with Allah. And you have energy to go and fight 30,000 people. You have courage to go and fight 30,000 people. You have a heart to go and fight. That's how we're supposed to be and that's how we are. Uh, I think that, honestly, I think that right now, we are in a generation where everything is sugar-coated for us. You know, I have empathy, I understand. A lot of us, we go through hard times and everyone's at a different level, I understand it. Yes. But I also understand that the world needs strong people, warriors, and needs people to lift the load. And I'm not gonna force anyone else to do it, but I'm definitely going to try to do it myself and ask people to come and help. Yes. You know, and I'll try to lift with you and you lift with me. This is the way the world's going oh, to work and yes. it constantly needs strong people. Definitely. The world needs that. It Definitely. needs strong people. So I can't sit here and say, oh, what am I going to do and compare myself and it's so hard and he's better than me and that's better. Everything's there. You're making a choice. Unless you are critically diagnosed with something, yeah. you're making a choice. choice. Yeah. And that choice is the difference between you and I. Yes. You know, I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to try to make the right one. Yes. If you want to make the wrong one, I'm going to try to help you. I'm going to give you my hand. Yeah. I won't judge. I'm going to be here. But I truly see you as someone who can help yourself if you want to. You're not helping yourself. Mm. You know? But sit down. Let's talk. You can help yourself. There's a lot at hand. Maybe Ayyub in the Quran. Well, I love, I love this dua. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's watching over Prophet Ayyub. And Prophet Ayyub goes through all the hardships, man. You want to talk about failures, man? Mm. Failures, exiled from his town, he loses all his kids, he's mm. sick, he has nothing. And then he says to Allah, Ilahi masani dur wa anta arhamur rahimin. He says, Lord, hardship has befallen me, tragedy has stricken me. He doesn't say, remove it from me. He yeah. says, and you are the most merciful. Wow. Khalas. Wow. A mountain of yeah. sabr. Yeah. You see, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. you love, you see, I trust in you, you're with me. When Allah is with you, then infinity is with you. Which? So if there's 10 or a million in front of me, yeah. no problem. You know, you really have to feel, when we say taqwa, you feel God present with you. He's with yeah. you wherever you are. Wherever you are. Wherever you, are. you have to understand that and yes. feel that. Yes. Amazing, amazing, beautiful. A God-centric person has strength of conviction and can take on the world.
احسنت ام حسين ده عارفه يا ام حسين هي سيز اللهم اجعلني اخشاك كاني اراك لود let me be humble before you as if i can see you as if i can see you imagine living as if Allah he can see you all the time amazing wow beautiful and you talked about spirituality as well and being a warrior so i want to use this as a bridge to one of your main projects and you're the founder of the spiritual warrior program mm. where you try to influence people in that way and work on their strength of conviction. Tell me more, how did this uh, start up? What made you realize that this is needed? This is a need in the community mm. in, uh, on a global scale. And uh, what, what is your goal with this at the end? Yes, so the spiritual warrior project is a mentorship program mm -hmm. that grew into an institution. Uh, it's a mentorship program where it started out as me taking on someone in a one-on-one -on -one course between him and I, a uh, young man, that I would teach and try to develop based on his own needs, mm. on the excellence he wants to reach, or based on the gaps that he has in his life that we try to fill and try mm. to solve. So it started out that way based on my own relationship with my teacher and every other if you want trope within popular culture, whenever there is a hero, there has to be a teacher above him that's giving him. This is the way that you're going to grow through a teacher, it's passed on to you, you go to a certain level, you pass it on. So this is a certain archetype that we have in Spiritual Warrior Project, we talk about archetypes. Mm. It's a certain blueprint for how a man should be. A mentorship course that teaches men how to live a lifestyle in which you are embodying your masculine attributes. Mm. We base that on archetypes. Archetypes are the blueprint of what it is that you're supposed to go for. A certain way that you're supposed to be and think. Because this way it's claimed, we claim, yeah. you will be fulfilled. You will have a fulfilling life. It's not about being happy in life. Imagine everyone's just happy every day in life. It's about being fulfilled, fulfilled. in meaning and fulfillment. Now for every archetype there's a shadow form, a negative. And you will see it in, in our daily lives. Like if a, a positive archetype was a king, someone who is just, someone who leads by example, someone who is decisive, someone who is ordered, that's, those are certain attributes that we try to teach the brother. Mm. At the same time, there's a shadow version of that, which is tyrannical, Dita dominant, dictator. Yeah. a dictator, or a weakling, whatever yeah. else it is. Yeah. So we go through the shadow forms, we go through the mature forms, and how we can achieve that for the specific person tailored to his needs. We started that out, alhamdulillah, it became something that was beyond what I expected. It wasn't just young men anymore. I've been with men who are in their 50s, 40s, 30s, millionaires. Wow. wow. In their 20s. The main is between 25 to 35. Um, in their relationships, in their lives, in their addictions, in their problems, in their excellence, in whatever else it is, in their ambitions, we were able to move forward together. And alhamdulillah, I think in the last three years, I've had one-on-one -on -one mentorships with about maybe 60 men. Uh, where I now have personal relationships with them and we have a little spiritual warrior army around the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alhamdulillah, we become very close. A lot of these brothers now are part of my team in Spiritual Warrior. Oh, wow. uh, some of them work with me on other projects. Some of them work with me for communities. I trust them now. They know me. I know them. I know their lives. Beautiful. Some of them have moved to Lebanon yeah, wow. next to me. Really? Yep. So yeah, we, we, it became something that we have for for our whole lives. Some of them moved to Hausa, yeah. some of them moved into a whole different thing. I, I, I train them for different purposes. Yeah. Uh, there is the male version and then the female version, the queen program, because I do the king program. The queen program, my wife, Zahra, she runs that for the sisters. Now, this grew into something bigger than I thought it was, and I couldn't keep up with how many people you know, would apply. Yeah. There's a big waiting list now, and I can't take on too many every month. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a standard mentorship takes six to eight weeks. And that's just the beginning of it. Yeah. Then it becomes a few more months. It becomes for two years, yeah, yeah. monthly. So it's something that's difficult to maintain. To, yeah. to maintain. Yeah. I found it very beneficial, sometimes more beneficial than lecturing. Because when I give lectures, I'm talking to a lot of people, yeah. but I never really get into you. No. And when I have a personal relationship with you, we're able to build a bond of brotherhood Definitely. and move forward together. Uh, and alhamdulillah, I have a lot to learn myself from the brothers that I'm with. I learn a lot as well. And we end up um, starting so many different programs together too for, to help our communities. So it's yeah. something that allows us an opportunity to collaborate. So I eventually decided to start recording courses. Courses that 
were relevant to the issues that I would find that were constant amongst men. So for example, the addiction to pornography or the habit of viewing pornography, because yeah. not everyone's addicted. Yeah. That was very prevalent amongst a lot of men mm -hmm. in all communities that I would talk to, in a lot of young men that I would mentor. Mm -hmm. So I realized, you know what, if this is a problem that so many guys have that no one talks about, yeah. then let me develop a course. I've done this for three years now and I've written, written a lot about it and read a lot into it. So I developed a course for it that's online that people can just sign up to watch yeah. on their own. And it was a way in which I was able to disseminate knowledge that was more universal than the knowledge that I would disseminate in my lectures, lectures. Islamic lectures. Yeah. So this is the way I look right now is when I go to different communities and I'm giving of my sciences, of the traditional, traditional sciences that I have studied, yes. Hausa. Spiritual warrior is something that even a non-Muslim can benefit from mm. because it's speaking about universal truths and principles that don't necessarily need you to believe in anything, even though I'm basing it on, yeah, on, on our beliefs. Actually, it's uh, centered around, in the beginning, the, uh, trying to become like Imam Ali alayhi salam, um, in terms of the king program, yeah. Amir al-Mu'mineen, yes. all right? So it's centered around that, but at the same time, you can apply these things to your life, whether it's your marriage, whether it's whatever it is. A lot of the time, people that came had done therapy already. And this isn't therapy, this is mentoring. mentoring yeah. I don't even like the term life coaching because yeah, yeah. it's not its not even life coaching no. because uh, a lot of it isn't coaching. A lot of it is coaching, a lot of it isn't coaching. But it's mentoring, it's different. When you mentor, you mimic, yeah. you try to... When you're learning from a mentor, you mimic, you try to copy to a certain extent, you absorb. This, the way that I was absorbing from my teachers. teachers yes. Until you absorb, until you can ascend, until you surpass yeah. your mentor. You move on to another mentor, a third, a fourth, a fifth. Usually, you have to have that teacher to move forward like that. Yeah. So, alhamdulillah, that way, we were able to speak to all these different uh, brothers. At the same time, have all these courses that were available for people to wow. sign up yeah, to. Yeah. And we're trying to grow with that. These courses opened up a way that a lot of the brothers that came to me for Spiritual Warrior, they wouldn't come to me in the mosque. So I'd get a lot of guys that were on drugs, or a lot of guys that were uh, drinking, or a lot of guys that were in gangs. Mm. They would come to me and they would speak to me, and then we wouldn't be in the mosque, we'd be in the gym. Mm. We'd be in a different type of facility. Yes. Uh, we would so solve... Were they comfortable? Yeah, yeah, we'd solve issues in different ways. I remember there was one brother, when we sat down, we spoke, he had a very hard time with confidence. He had a very hard time meeting people. He had a lot of potential, he was very smart, but he didn't know how to interact, even with women, he didn't know how to interact, how to get married, how to make friends. Yeah, yeah. He was always wary. So I asked him if he had ever been in a fight before, and he said, no, never. Yeah. Never been in any sort of conflict. And this is something that in the Spiritual Warrior Project and the program, you have to train, you have to be in difficult situations. Yes. So I've got, alhamdulillah, a lot of friends around the world. So you fought him? No, no, I didn't <laughs> fight him. I watched him as he fought, though. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I brought one of my friends to spar with him. Yeah, okay. So I brought one of my friends and I said, spar? Yeah. And he said, what kind of sheikh are you? You're making me punch someone in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, no. Take it easy. Yeah. Go to a certain extent where you're pressuring him, yeah. but let him feel it. Yeah. Let him fight back. Let him. This is a metaphor for his life now. Mm. No one's going to help him when he's down in the dumps. When he's in the corner and he's getting pounded on, he needs to fight back. He needs yes. to pick himself up. Yes. He needs to defend himself. So as he's getting punched, he punches back. And there's something about fighting. And this is all with headgear. No one say you're doing something haram. Yeah. This is all safe. Uh, there's something about when you're fighting or when you're running or when you're in any sort of sport and you're trying to push yourself. To the limit. Yeah, yeah you, you think you're done, but you're yeah. not really done. You test yourself. You know more about who you are. Yeah. When he finished, of course, dopamine was all over the place. He was so happy, yeah. he was excited. He wanted to train more and more and more. And it was, it was a way for him to come out of his box. And then when you fight generally, you stop being scared of a lot of other situations of course, because yes. you know yourself yes. in the most difficult situation. You know you're not from glass. Yeah, yeah. you're not made of glass, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So then you start talking to people a bit more. Mm. You, you become a bit more confident. You become someone who will take the lessons that 
he gained in those very difficult situations Situation. and applied them to, yeah. to your normal life. Beautiful, beautiful. And you said you had 60 students uh, across the three years, uh, the, the last three years. How do you manage to give them all their tailored and customized mentorship? Because you have your lecturing, you have your studies. How, how do you balance all this together? Yeah, I mean, that's why there's a big waiting list yeah, now, yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah, because I can't. Mm. Um, Alhamdulillah, I try to take on a few brothers, uh, three brothers maybe, every two months. You know, something yeah, yeah. like that. And then I spend a lot of time with them. Yeah. And you still have the relationships that you built yeah. with the brothers previously that you don't let go of. Yeah. You're still yeah. there for them. Yeah. But what we're doing right now is you try to scale it. And it's difficult because you to scale it, you have to mentor someone to be able to do what you do. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, for example, one of the brothers is one that I have so much hope in. And I see a lot of potential in him. And he's someone that right now I'm mentoring to do what I'm doing with other brothers. Wow. So okay. if I can't do it, you're going to give these courses and you're going to be able to provide this brotherhood and you're, yeah. and hopefully over time I can make a team like that. Mashallah, uh, that's otherwise, yeah. I can't. It's going, to be, have to, it's going to have to be the courses, Definitely. you know? But yeah, having a few brothers that I trust and invest in, if I have five, I give all my time to and I can really invest in them and then they invest in others, that's how it will grow. Because it mm -hmm. can't stay with you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so limited. Like you said, there's a big waiting list and there's only so much I can do. Yeah. But when, for example, me, I'm now very interested to apply, but I want mentorship from Sid Hussain, of course, not from someone else, <laughs> although I respect everyone. But what's it like when, you, when there's not a waiting list? When I apply, how does it look like? We get in touch and you ask me what I want, what my goals are, what I struggle with, mm. and how does it go from so that? So the team... Yeah. My team, alhamdulillah, God bless them, they deal with the logistics. Yeah. And then they, they book everything for me so that I can focus only on my relationship with uh -huh. the brother. Okay. And then we have a weekly one hour session. Mm -hmm. uh, me and the brother will talk about everything that we want and we set objectives for the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the week, they have my contact details. If there's anything they need, I'm on standby. Mm -hmm. Depending on what it is they need to do, we correspond throughout that week until we meet the second week, yeah. see how the last week went, they have accountability, mind, body, soul, relationships, and vocation. We go through everything. And we have books that we go through together. And we will have um, exercises that we go through together. Um, you know, a, a, obviously a, a workout plan. I think the body is very important when it comes to trying to reach any sort of excellence in life. So you have to train, that's a part of it. And then we have whatever they're looking for in their purpose, their meaning. Each person yeah. has a different reason. So we go, we tailor it according to that. And then every week we hold ourselves accountable for what we did. If we stick to our promises or not, yeah. we find what the triggers are. And then we build week upon week to the point gets to a point where it becomes two weeks, yeah, yeah. one month, two months. And later just months, to check up. And check up okay, yeah. and brothers. And then maybe yeah. I refer per people to that person if they can take over and they can wow. do it themselves. Amazing. So Alhamdulillah, it was a very successful... So you're building a small army. You started with yourself. You're yeah. building a small army of spiritual yeah, warriors. Yeah, it's there. Allah. It's there. Alhamdulillah, it's Alhamdulillah. already there. Shukr. What a it's already the very loyal brothers. All my brothers watching this right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you very much, my brothers. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, beautiful to hear. And sticking on the uh, topic of spirituality, because that's something very important, even in your religion, you need that spiritual flame. And we have the month of Muharram, Alhamdulillah, where the spiritual flame, the harara fi qulub, that never extinguishes, burns with us. But after the holy month of Ramadan, after the holy month of Muharram, after a spiritual journey, ziyara, going on pilgrimage, sometimes we face situations, moments in our life where that flame, spiritual flame becomes a spark and we don't have that uh, sweetness of Iman anymore when we pray or when we perform an act of worship. How do we deal then? How do we stick to uh, the basics when we don't have that motivation or uh, inspiration to keep on track with our spirituality? Because we face th those moments. I'm asked this question quite often yeah. and what I always respond with is do you worship Allah or do you worship spirituality? Because well, they're two different things. Yeah. Because if you're doing it to feel good, the sweetness, you want that sweetness and you're not getting the sweetness that you used to get and then now you're demotivated and you don't want to do it and you're not bothered to pray or to go and then you have to really ask yourself what are you doing it for? Mm. Are you doing it to feel good? Yeah. 
Because that's like that little minor shirk that's like the, the ant, the black ant on the black stone, in the black forest, in the black night. Yeah. You know, it's there somewhere. You have to worship for truth's sake, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's your creator and you are his created being and you are his servant and you owe him. <laughs> but that's, that's so basic but so important that, to realize this is the, yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is the reality yeah, yeah. you're not entitled to exist yeah yes, yes. You, didn't, you don't you don't deserve yeah. to be here yeah you did nothing to earn a right to be here yeah, yeah, yeah. you're here out of his grace and mercy and you need to say thank you much that's so that's so yeah it's so deep actually it is, it is. Yeah, well, yeah, it's yeah. a whole different way of seeing it yeah so it's not about feeling good and spiritual but yeah. Allah out of his kindness yeah. lets you feel spiritual because there's a certain effect that is given upon you. A certain effect that allows you to feel beautiful and in love when you're close to him because of how amazing he is. Yeah. And you have to realize that's a gift and it's not always there. Sometimes he takes it away and sometimes he gives it to you. And when he gives it to you, be thankful. And use of it. The and use, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when it's not there, say, Alhamdulillah, Lord, whatever you see wow. fit for me, yeah, yeah. I'm still here. I'm still your servant. I'm still going to be here when it's dry. Yeah. Because if I'm only praying on point when I feel good, I'm doing it for me, not for you. Yes, but, yes. But if I'm doing this when I have to, because successful people do what they have to do, whether they feel like it or not, this applies in finances, mm -hmm. at work. You don't want to go to work and be there every day at 8 a.m., mm -hmm. but you do because you get fired if you don't go. Yes, right? yes, yes. So you go. It doesn't matter how you feel. The gym, it doesn't matter how you feel. You have a goal. And your spirituality is the same. Same, yes, the same. And your worship is the same. But the Imam says that you have different halat. You have iqbal and idbar. Mm. Iqbal is when you're feeling that closeness to do as much as you can in that time. And when you have idbar, when you are feeling not as spiritual, when you are when you are feeling low, stick to the basics at that time until you come back, because it's always going to be up and down. No one stays at a certain high level for good, but you have to be able to bring the treasures with you when you're flying, to bring them back down to your daily life when you're living a very usual mundane life until you fly again and you bring treasures with you again. You have to prepare. When you're flying, you have to prepare for winter. Mm. There's always going to be winter. Yes. It's going to be very cold. But when winter comes, you wrap up, summer will always come again. Yeah. It cycles. It's very normal for it to be cycles. I have to acknowledge this and prepare for this. And no, I was never meant to be spiritual all year round. Yes. I have to live with the cycles, mm. acknowledge winter when it's winter, and embrace summer when it's summer, and live with Allah as His servant. Yes, yes. You opened my eyes because now I think about it, how arrogant are we to always want that sweetness? Yeah, expecting that sweetness. Yeah. yeah. We shouldn't expect that sweetness. It's because yeah. we fall in love. Yeah. When you taste the sweetness, yeah. you don't want anything else in life. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's so beautiful and you want to go after it. Yeah. But be careful that it becomes the goal. Mm. Yes, yes. Because what if Allah says, you know what, take the sweetness. You're straying from the real goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Khalas, take yeah. the sweetness. Yeah. You want sweetness, fine, take it. Take it, yes. Go. It's like anything else now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's so amazing. And... I wanted to talk about community as well because community also plays a huge role when it comes to religiosity, spirituality and what you're trying to accomplish with your uh, project as well, spiritual. You're creating basically a community of leaders, of people who can stand up for the strength of conviction, who are strong in their beliefs. Um, what is a successful community in your opinion? What, what, what are the fundamentals of a successful community and what should be the outcome of a successful community? Islam is a communal religion. Yes. It's a religion in which we're supposed to be together. Mm. Imam Sadiq constantly advises us and emphasizes the group dua as being more beneficial and more beloved to Allah than the dua that's performed by that's one person. So we are people who we understand the importance of solitude. We have atikaf, we have different points in our lives where we're alone and supportant. And you're supposed to wake up in the middle of the night to pray and speak to Allah even before Fajr. It's important. That's your ghar hira. Mm. That's when you're alone. That's your cave. But also, we're supposed to have a certain community that we're a part of and come to Allah together. The way that I see it, 
community does not have to be what we think it is, as in programs and lectures and sheikhs coming to speak to us. It starts very, very small. And I spoke to my brothers in London recently, they're telling me to come back, yeah. come back to London. And I told them, look, if I come back, I have to come back to something mm. where it's running the way that we want to run it. So I said, all I need is 10 of you, 10 solid brothers. You guys all go make money, come back, we buy houses next to each other. None of this one hour away stuff. Uh -huh. All of us near each other, one hour. Each one's married to a good woman, 10 boys, 10 girls. All right, now there's 20 of us. Yeah. Each of us have three kids. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's 50 of us. Yeah. I'm just giving an example here. That's just amazing small community. We yeah. work on that from the beginning. We have a little school, a little center, and we're together and we start to grow. If I can't do that, I mean, I know it's far-fetched, but yeah. I'm just giving you an example. Yeah, yeah. I was dreaming already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> look, I actually don't believe it's far-fetched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is something that we can do. It's possible, and I think yeah. that it's important that we start to look at yeah. uh, our communities moving forward in the next generations. Definitely. I look at my daughter, I think about her children, mm. and I'm worried. And so I need to create a certain environment now where we're all close by. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is important. But I digress. I don't want to get into that right now. I'm just talking about this. It starts with your family. It, at home, if I wake up and I pray Salat al-Jama'ah with my wife and my children and they understand it to be a community between us as a family that we do things together, that we sit down together, we eat together. That's why Imam Sadiq, he says, when you break your fast in Ramadan, it's only the only time when it's better to postpone Maghrib is to eat with your family because they're waiting for you. If they're waiting for you, don't go pray, go yeah. sit, sit with them. Community, this is community. Yeah. Community is to realize to interact with them in a way where your worship doesn't become self-righteous mm. and arrogant. Yeah. Community is where you serve. Community is where you realize that the people's needs for you are an opportunity for you. You serve them. Since I got here, you've been helping me with everything. You've been so kind and helpful. Oh. Alhamdulillah, and I'm so grateful to have people like you here. But this is, you're saying, if I wish I could do this full time, I want to serve, I want to help, I want yeah. to bring people to faith. Community allows you opportunities to express your faith and religion where you otherwise are not able to when you're alone, mm -hmm. when you're serving the people. But it starts really small. We don't have to think about it as 500 people, Numbers, yeah. 100 people, 50 people. Successful community is a group of people, five people, four people, whoever else it is, your family, your wife and your children, you're the community. You guys pray together, and you eat together, and you talk to each other, and you sit down, and you have a mission statement. Yes. All right, what is this family meant for? And we try to grow that to the outer community slowly. I think that the idea of a successful community comes after defining what a community even is. Mm. And I think we're defining it right now. Definitely, definitely. And in defining it, we also have to keep in mind that the challenges we face, we need a strong community, like you said, like you described. Because you said, I don't want to get into it about your daughter and uh, <laughs> But that is an important uh, matter to get into. Mm. Uh, the disruption of the family concept, the attacks on the concept family, and uh, people not getting married these days, not, not possible getting married, and the communities lacking. Uh, building a foundation where people can uh, blossom and find a partner and build up a family because this uh, attacks on the marriage and the family concept is very uh, getting more and more severe and I'm afraid for the future like you said you're afraid of yeah, you raising be. raising your daughter you should be but what, what, what is your thought on this on the family concept and being a, the disruption of it and the attacks on it and how can we as Muslims with not having the strongest of communities, but like you said, having 10 people who are sincere, who are devoted, how can we weaponize, weaponize or armor ourselves against these attacks? I think in the beginning, you have to realize you're already playing catch up. Yeah. Because you're in a place that isn't an environment for your religious progress and spiritual progress. So you have to start to create it around you and you can create that around you. You have to create a little, at least in the beginning, a small bubble mm. between you and, and the brothers and sisters and the children to the extent that you're able to guide them as they grow into coming out of the bubble with them. So it's not that you guard them from everything and they can't see the world. 
no, no, see the world with me. Yeah. I want my daughter to see the world with me. Yes. I'll be right there yeah. in a safe space without smothering her. I'll allow her to experience and to understand. But I'll do it in a way that suits her, whether it's me or her mother or her cool aunt or cousin or whatever else it is, but I'll guard it from the top because I created an environment for her from the very beginning. That's why it all starts, I'm, I'm going to use the example of a child here to answer your question. The child absorbs everything it hears and sees. Yes. Sometimes people think that just because an infant is an infant, they can't understand. They might swear in front of the infant. There's music by the infant, the different visuals on the screens in front of the infant. But the infant absorbs everything and their soul absorbs everything even if they don't intellectually comprehend it. Mm -hmm. So I protect her eyes and her ears from everything unless it's okay for it to seep into her soul. I'm going to do this in a way that doesn't smother her. I have to do this in a way where I have to be very educated, read a lot of books on how to raise children. I'm starting from very fresh now mm -hmm. in raising a child. I see my family is going to rely on how I raise this child because I don't want to have a thousand years of my ancestors being Muslim and then in one generation I mess everything up mm -hmm. where my descendants, my grandkids or their kids what apostate. Yes. Where they, they leave the, the path, I can't accept that. I have to create something at the very least right now within the West and I understand not everyone in the West can leave mm. Uh, because there is always hijrah to go to an Islamic country or to go to an environment that aids you But that's not always available to everyone, especially people born in these lands It's not like there's any way of going to go that's going to accept you. Maybe that's how you feel I mean, I've been in Lebanon for 10 years. They still call me Arab, Afwan, they call me uh, uh, British, British yeah. They still call me British. In England they call me Arab and I was born there. Yeah. So We're all children of diaspora. So it's difficult. We grew up in these lands. It's hard to leave these lands. So I don't I'm not blaming people if they can't leave. We have to understand the context of what's happening. Of course, if it gets to a place that you're not going to protect your family, it becomes haram for you to stay there. Yes. You know. But if you're navigating, hey, you're, you're, you're born and raised here, I'm born and raised in the UK, and we're on the path of Islam, it's possible. It's just not as likely yeah. as, as every other path, but it's possible. So it's there. Um, we have to create that environment for our children, whether it's schools or centers, and having a close, tight-knit community, like I explained a minute ago, yeah. of all of us living around it, like-minded people yes. as well. And we have to be very involved in our children's lives. So there was a beautiful school that I came across in Qom a few weeks ago. It's Agha Panahyan School. And he doesn't accept anyone into that school yeah. easily. You have to have interviews. The parents have to be vetted and they have to be very willing to be involved in their children's classes. The way he teaches the kids is seven years, seven years, just like the yeah. narration. Yeah. Seven years, let them play, but teaches them values through their play. Mm -hmm. And their parents must come into school and the father teaches his son how to be a man. And the mother teaches her daughter how to be a woman. That's and nice. he has to go hiking yeah, and, yeah. and they go on different expeditions and swimming and, and archery and whatever other activities. But the child's constantly interacting with their parent. And if we are going to live a lifestyle, a modern lifestyle, where the child is no longer interacting with their parent, where the father isn't the one teaching their child Qur'an, in the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, the father is the one who should teach his child Qur'an. Uh -huh. He is the one who should teach his child dhikr of Allah and take him to the mosque, the father. Uh -huh. The father. And that's why in the narrations he gets custody in, after, after two years. Yeah. He is the one who teaches the child. I don't see many fathers teaching their children Qur'an. A lot of the time their child knows more Qur'an than them because yeah. they go to madrasa. Yeah. They teach their dads Qur'an. They have to have a relationship built on Allah. If you don't have that, what do you mean by family? Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you mean by family? Even if there was nothing attacking from the outside, nothing to armor through, mm -hmm. it's just lost. It's going uh, on roads that are very subjective. Yeah. But if the father is ordered like I mentioned, he has those attributes of a king yeah. and he's just and he protects his family and the mother is there and she is also fulfilling her role with the children and nourishing them in the way that only the mother can and these children grow up in this habitat that we've created and then we guide them slowly by taking their hand allowing them to see the world with us in a relationship of trust and love and honesty and 
exploration. We go, we read, we see, safe space without judgment. If we can have a community that's built upon these principles, and like I mentioned, 10 families, five families, it's enough to have that and be very careful about the bad apple. Mm. You know, be very careful about it's not to exclude people, but you have to be very careful. The idea of the rotten apple came from one rotten apple in a bag with 10 good apples. If you close it up the next day, they're all rotten. rotten. So be very careful. You know, a lot of the time, our children, when, when we see little girls in Madrasa reading 50 something something, that book, why are you reading that at the Islamic school? Yeah. The other kids showed you it. You're all in an Islamic school. Yeah. This is the thing, schools can't raise the kids, the parents have to raise the kids. Yes. So if so the parents... It's the opposite nowadays. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If yeah. the parents aren't doing the job at home, mm -hmm. that kid's coming to school and going to infect other kids. Mm -hmm. so, which is why a lot of schools, for example, right now, the stricter schools, maybe they don't accept uh, your child into the school if you allow him too much screen time. Because the other kids don't have that much screen time, he's going to ruin it for everyone else. Yeah. These are the, uh, the schools on the stricter end of things. Not everyone can do that. No. I'm talking as someone who can be considered quite strict, yeah. right? But not everyone can do, I understand, which is fine. There are different Islamic schools around the world that are more lenient and that's okay. Yeah. I'm just giving an example of what I believe we need in uh, our growing communities right now. And it's still early days, there's still so much. What I'm saying right now is still very general, yeah, and very yeah. in the air. It's very different when it's applied on the ground. Yeah. But I really believe that we're in difficult times. We have to start taking this very, very seriously. Uh, you have to start really thinking about where you want to live in the world yeah. and if it's suitable for you and you have to look at the community you live in. Some people move because of a high paying job. You ask them, how's the community there? They say, what community? Oh yeah, I'm sure it's good. You didn't check the community? Mm -hmm. The community is important. Yes. That's going to be how your kids are raised. raised yeah. So is that a suitable community for you? And if it's not, you have to do what you have to do to bring a community together. I was speaking to your father this morning and he told me when he first came from Afghanistan, he was alone. Yeah. And he started to slowly reach out to people, start to bring a Maulana, start to do something. You yeah. have to, you have to start somewhere. So you start somewhere, you know, right now, I feel that I am someone who's become very strict with this issue because of how much is out there yeah. and how much, how likely it is that they take the soul of our young children. So I'll do whatever I can to protect that soul yes. in, in the beginning, a small bubble, and then slowly moving out of that. Yeah. You said you kept it general, but you said something in the beginning as well. You said, we're already behind. We have to catch up. So there is no time to sit still and wait to more trends coming no, up. No, no, there isn't. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. I already have several, several friends of mine mm -hmm. who are going to different lands to build new communities. Mm in the way that they believe in them. Yeah. And they've asked for my help and I told them, of course, and I'll come and visit you guys. In the West, in Western community society. In the West or even in the East, in different places, like for example, in Oman, for okay. example, one of my friends is, yeah. is starting to build a community there and I'm gonna go and help him. Wow. A Western community within an Eastern country oh. with, with, with a, an environment that aids them. But slowly, it's a Western community of people that want to do Hijrah yeah. to a place that's still relatively modern, modern. but it's still an Islamic society that's still, a, still on offer, that's still available, yeah. you know what I mean? For those who can't do that, yes, in the West, like in London, a lot of my friends are starting that out and I'll be there to help them too. Yeah. So it's just that in an Islamic country, you have a much better environment to help of course, you. Of course, and inshallah, may we all find the salvation, but we all seek salvation through different means, of course, within the limits of Quran and Ahl al-Bayt, within the perks. But true salvation is only when the Holy Imam of our time, Imam al-Mahdi Allah Ta'ala Faraj al-Sharif returns and fill this earth with justice like it was filled with injustice. Ahsan. And um, what are our biggest responsibilities, me as a youth in the West, me as a Muslim Shia following the Quran and Ahl al-Bayt, knowing that the Imam Hussein of my time is alive? What is my responsibility? What, what do I have to do to serve the Imam of my time too? set the ground layers for his reappearance, inshallah. You see, this is also a good point because when the Imam returns yeah. and he asks, who do I have in France yeah. and in Britain? And who do I have in Holland? And who do I have in Germany? And who do I have in Australia and America and Canada? Some of us have to put our hands up. Yeah. So there have to be people there. Yeah. And those people have a very different mission to people in the East. Yeah. Everyone has a mission in a different place. 
I think that what we spoke about in the last 10 minutes is actually the first on the list when it comes to uh, brothers and sisters uh, like you guys here in this community, where you develop a community with standards of excellence that allow our children to flourish with enough facilities that they're not at risk of apostasy within one generation. So we have to be people of knowledge, people who are ready, uh, people who are involved in the community around us, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, people who are aware. I think all of us have to uh, put a lot of effort, all of us, doesn't matter who you are, mm. a lot of effort into becoming this type of aware person in today's day and age in order to create this community. I think this community that we're talking about right now is incumbent, is a is incumbent upon yeah. all of us, you and I. Yeah. It's the most important thing that we can do. Because it's not an utopia. People may believe it's an utopia, but it, it is something we no, have to work towards too. Yeah. It's not, of course. Yeah. So I think building community right now is the number one priority for the followers of the Imam. And I think this is what will protect your soul most of all. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very much, Sayyidna. Habibi. Thank you very much, Sayyidna, for sharing these wisdom, life lessons. And we had some banter as well this time. So may Allah bless you for that. Thank it you. was an absolute honor to have you here. And we hope to have many more collaborations. And Thank you, hosting you here again. The honor is mine. Ta'ala. Shukran. A pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, dear viewers, for tuning in. Uh, as this is still a new concept for us, we're new in this game. Please give us feedback, leave a reaction, uh, uh, subscribe, like and share. And help us evolve and develop so we can help the community. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.